light, love, life. For 16 years, I was a professional surfer. That's what I did to make my living. Coming from a Jewish family, take these off. I knew I'd be a professional. It was Destin, accountant, a lawyer, doctor. But definitely, it wasn't going to be a professional surfer. Like many of my friends at university, I also decided to specialize. And my specialty was tube riding. And here's a picture of a tube ride. And that's what it looked like deep inside the tube. It's a wonderful moment when time seems to be expanded, when the past is just behind your shoulder, the present is rushing beneath your feet, and the future is just ahead of you, unfolding. And always, you're riding for the light. Always riding for the light ahead of you. I became pretty good as a professional surfer, and every year I would travel to Hawaii to surf in the big surfing events. There was three premier breaks in Hawaii. One of them was the Banzai Pipeline, the world's most dangerous wave. Every year, two or three, three people died at the Banzai Pipeline. There was also Waimea Bay, the world's largest waves. Even today, Waimea Bay is considered the world's largest wave that one can paddle into. And often during the winter season, we'd have to ride waves of 25, 30 feet. And then there was my favorite, Sunset Beach, the ultimate canvas for big wave performance surfing. I became a, quite an expert on wipeouts at all of these breaks. And a wipeout at each break was different, but they all had a commonality. They were all harrowing. I used to hate to open my eyes under the water. I was terrified. I was terrified about what I might see. There was so much turbulence down there. It was frightening violence. So I used to keep my eyes tightly shut, and I used to tuck myself into a little ball and just hope for the best. The one feeling that was common to wipeouts at Waimea Pipeline and Sunset was a feeling of utter and absolute helplessness. Especially when you fell. You didn't know how bad that impact was going to be, but you knew it was going to be bad. It was like putting on a blindfold and walking across a freeway at 5 p.m. on a Friday afternoon and hoping you were going to get hit by a price and not being hit by an 18-wheeler. It was harrowing. I had a particularly bad wipe out at a place called Sunset Beach once. It took me down deep, a 15-foot wave, deeper and deeper and deeper. And I was a very, very fit athlete, never panicked. And it took me down deep for so long that I started to run out of gas. And I started to kick for the surface. My eyes still tightly shut. I would never open my eyes. And I got right near the surface. You could sense where that light was. Bang. The next wave hit me. So this is what in surfing we call a two-wave hold-down. You're under two waves. <clears throat> Very few people survive a two-wave hold-down. This wave drove me deep. Again, I went through the same cycle, being bashed around by the t turbulence, terribly violent. And for the first time in my life, I thought I was going to die. I opened my eyes under the water also for the first time ever. And it was dark down there, and it was terrifying. And I looked up, and I saw the light and I swam to the light to save my life. My wife and I moved to this beautiful area in 1995 with our beautiful son, Matthew. And the beach just down the street from us in Montecito was Hammond's Reef. If you've ever been down to Hammond's Reef, you'll notice that it's a very calming, beautiful little neighborhood beach. And the whole atmosphere at Hammond's is spiritual. They have a wonderful meadow um, just on the eastern side of the beach called Shilawa Meadow. And it's a meadow that used to be peopled by the Shumash, who lived here many hundreds of years ago. They had a settlement there, and they fished and lived off the land. And there's a beautiful monument decorated by dolphin figurines on the beach, and people leave offerings. Um, and it's also often visited by the Shumash. So Matthew and I used to love going to Hammonds. It was our favorite beach. We loved going surfing um, out there together. We'd sit and wait for waves together. And when he'd be waiting for a wave, he'd often paddle up to me and sit right next to me in the lineup. And he'd sling his arm around my shoulder. And it was an amazing sensation to be sitting out there with your son with his arm around. He didn't care what his friends thought. He was out there with Dad. So Hammonds had um, a very special feeling for, for both of us. So this particular day, it was a stormy day. We'd gone down. We checked out the surf. We'd sat on there. There was a little bench we used to sit on and check it out. And there was no surf. He said, Dada. That's what he used to call me when no one else was around, especially his friends. Dada, 
let's go and check out the memorial. So he ran off and I followed him and scampered across the trail and up to the beautiful meadow and up to the memorial. And we stood there in front of the memorial <coughs> and there are these words, very profound, very memorable words that are inscribed on the memorial. And it's uh, written by, the, by a Shumash poet. The sacredness of the land lies in the mind of its people. This land is dedicated to the spirit and memory of the ancestors and their children. I'd never read the inscription before, and on this particular day, it just touched me. It was profound, this connection to the land, to the future, to the past. So Matthew scampered off down the beach again. He wasn't too interested in what was written on the, on the memorial. And I followed him along. I could see a plan was percolating in his head ran down to the beach, and he started collecting cobblestones that grew along the, 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 the rest along the beach at, at Hammonds. And he made an enormous circle of cobblestones. And I helped him along. I knew he had a plan. I, I didn't want to ask. I just followed along like a good, obedient father. So he made this enormous circle. And inside that, with him, we made another circle. And inside that second circle, we made another circle. So we had three concentric circles on the sand at Hammonds. Just the two of us on the beach. No one else on the beach on this stormy day. He went off and got two large rocks and put these two rocks in the center of the innermost circle and then made a pathway to all of them. Ran back down the beach and came back with a stick. And in the stick he put a feather and some kelp. And I said, Matthew, what is this? He had me sit down on the one rock in the center and he sat down on the other rock facing one another. He said, Dada, this is a sacred story circle. And this is a sacred story stick. And what we're going to do is we're going to tell each other stories. So for an hour, Matthew and I sat on the beach together inside the sacred story circle and told each other stories. You know, I can't really remember what the stories were about. But they were sacred stories because we made them so. There was a connection between father and son that was electric. And in this connected world that we're in, it was a rarity that it was just me and him inside that sacred story circle telling each other sacred stories. We had a beautiful time on the beach. We got up and walked off towards home, jumped in the car. My home's about half a mile away. And we came to the front door. Matthew dug in his pocket and pulled out one of the stones from the sacred story circle. And I said, Matthew, what's that? He said, Dada, this is a sacred story stone. You know all the stories we told today? They're all inside that stone. For me, it was an amazing moment that my son had kept all his stories inside that sacred story stone. In 2006, Carter and I were living the good life. We'd started a company called Solitude. We sold in all the finest stores in the nation, Saks, Barney's, Bloomingdale's, Nordstrom's, you name it. My wife created these beautiful designs. This is one of her wonderful shirts from the era. And we got a phone call. <clears throat> a large company in New York wanted to buy us. A company called Oxford Apparel. Made us an offer. And uh, we accepted a deal, and uh, they blew the brand up big, and were going to take it into J.C. Penney's and start selling tens and tens of millions of dollars um, of product. They created a beautiful studio for us in Montecito, put us on a three-year contract, and uh, uh, we just thought the future that was unfolding for us um, it was wonderful. At the same time, we decided that we would take our son Matthew down to my old school in South Africa for a semester, my old uh, private school called Clifton. And uh, Carla and Matthew went down there, and uh, he was just doing great at school. He was prospering, his grades were really uh, fantastic, and uh, I was due to go down there to see the family. Um, twenty fourth of April two thousand and six nine a m we were due to have a conference call a three way conference call between Carla 
in South Africa myself and the head office in New York. I phoned through to South Africa and my son picked up the phone. Hey, Dada, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Matthew. He said, listen to this. And he read me this beautiful essay, an essay that really spoke to the essence of that surfing experience. I told you that my specialty in surfing had been tube riding. And he really captured that more eloquently than had ever been written before. At the time, I didn't know he'd wrote, written it. He, so he read me this beautiful piece, and I said, Matthew, where did you get that from? He said, Dada, I wrote that piece. I wrote that piece for class today. I said, Matthew, I'm so proud of you. It's fantastic. Carla got on the line. He said, Dad, I've got to go now. I love you. I said, I love you too, Matthew. There was a knock on the door. A Japanese film crew had come to interview me for a magazine they'd flown out from Japan. And they said, take me, take us to a, a, your local beach. So, of course, I took them down to Hammonds, my favorite beach. And we walked down the beautiful trail, and it was a magnificent California day. Crisp fall air, or crisp spring, crisp, uh, spring air. But you know, there was a feeling of unease. I just had this feeling of unease that something was wrong um, with the world. It was all too, too perfect. So they interviewed me, took some photos, and we were walking back along the trail. Beautiful, big eucalyptus. I stopped by this big eucalyptus. And the Japanese interviewer said, uh, um, stopped with me. And I turned around and I said to him, <clears throat> you know, there's nothing more important than a positive attitude. I don't know why I said that. He looked at me. It was sort of out of the blue. I said it like it was some sort of revelation. We walked off, jumped into the car, and drove back to the office. At 11 a.m., I got the phone call. Matthew was dead. <sighs> Just like that, from Carla. Matthew was dead. He'd been playing a dangerous game and it had fatal consequences. But I'd just been speaking to him. He read me that beautiful essay. The four words of that essay that jumped out at me, the light shines ahead. The light shines ahead. How is that possible? It was a harrowing trip back to South Africa. But I knew... I had to get there as fast as I can because I knew that without me, my wife would not survive. Our friends rallied around us. Someone got me a ticket. Someone got me a passport. I didn't even have a passport. My, I was going down to South Africa the following week, and my passport was at the passport office. And I managed to get back and pull my wife in my arms. <clears throat> and Carla was in a terrible state, as was I. And uh, I had to admit my wife to the psych ward because I just really didn't think she was going to make it. It was a terrible time for us. So after a couple of weeks, Carla was recovering slowly, um, as was I. We had, uh, we had great help from different medical practitioners who would say that one step at a time, time is your friend. One step at a time, time is your friend. And it was just so uh, hard for, for us. I mean, I tried to give my baby as much love as I could, and she tried to give me as much, but our lives were, our lives, our lives were over. And we just couldn't understand how was it possible that our beautiful boy <clears throat> was gone. So a friend came to visit us at the hospital. He walked in to Carla's room, while it was lying on the bed. Her mom was on the bed with her, and I was sitting next to him. And he said, I have a message for you. I have a message from Matthew. And with that, a bolt of lightning hit that hospital and a giant thunderclap out of a clear blue sky. Can you believe that? One bolt of lightning. If that doesn't make you believe in something else, it, it was absolutely unbelievable. He said, Matthew wants you to forgive him. What he did was an accident. He made a mistake. He's sorry. 
And that bolt of lightning was the first step in our stage of recovery. And I think that bolt of lightning was a turning point for us. It was a long road to recovery. Eventually, we came back to Santa Barbara. Friends helped us. Family helped us. And I dreaded going surfing. Dreaded going surfing again. How could I even go surfing again? So eventually, a friend phoned me up and said, Sean, I've got to get you. I've got to get you out in the water again. So he took me to this break. I'd never surfed it before. Beautiful little bay. Paddled out together, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried on the way out. And that wave came to me, and I turned around, and I rode that wave in, and I kicked out. And I felt a measure of peace. And I paddled up to my friend, and I said to him, what's the name of this break? He said, it's Sunrise. And I thought, oh, well, that is such a beautiful name for what I am now experiencing, that maybe... The sun is rising for me again. And I thought of those four words that my boy had written in that beautiful essay that he had read to me two hours before he died. Dada, the light shines ahead. The light shines ahead. So my wife and I grieved very differently. I threw myself into lots of new projects, dedicating my spirit to my boy. I made a film. I wrote a book. And in both of these projects... I printed my boy's beautiful essay so that the whole world could read these wonderful words that he'd read to me two hours before he died. You know, for both of us, it was like a storm had whipped through a forest and two trees had fallen. And they'd fallen on top of each other as these trees were falling and held each other up because our love grew stronger we grew together, and we kept each other up. On the 25th of August last year, we got a phone call that would change our lives. An adoption attorney said, are you still interested in adopting? Because Carla and I had discussed this. He said, a baby's been born. Are you interested? Yes, we're interested. He said, there's a couple of problems. The baby was born a month premature. Uh, we said, well, what was the original birth date? The original birth date was the 25th of September. But that was Matthew's birthday. The 25th of September, that's Matthew's birthday. That's our baby. That's our baby, Carla said. I'll never forget my wife saying that. That's our baby. That's our baby. She said, there's another problem. Under California law, open adoption policy. The mother chooses the parents. So there's a whole host of other parents who are interested in this child who are in front of you. But I'll submit your profile. My wife wrote a beautiful profile about us. She submitted it to the birth mother. We had another call back. She wants a picture of Matthew. Carla sent a picture of Matthew. She said, did you know what the mom wanted to call the baby. The mom wanted to call the baby Matthew. She was going to be born. He was going to be born on Matthew's birthday. The mom wanted to call the baby Matthew. For us, there was a realization there <clears throat> that there was a higher order at work. We got the call the next day, the baby's ours. Carl and I drove up to the hospital in a state of delirious happiness. It was an amazing moment for us. Driving to that hospital and seeing our boy for the first time. You know, people say, is the feeling with an adopted child going to be the same as with a biological child? Are you going to feel that same connection? Are you going to feel that same instant bond? And I, had, I was nervous of that fact. And as soon as I picked up that little boy, just had that same amo amazing, overwhelming feeling of love that I had when I first picked up Matthew. <clears throat> My hero when I was growing up was a guy called Duke Hanamoku, a famous Hawaiian surfer who represented the, the living embodiment of the Aloha spirit, the, the Hawaiian spirit of sharing. He was an Olympian, just a great hero of mine. 
Luke was born on the 24th of August as well. So that was sort of another sign. So we saw Luke, had this amazing moment with him in the hospital, and then we went upstairs to meet the birth mom. We walked into her room, and there was this angel lying there. I looked down at her, and I was looking down at Carla. She was the twin of my wife. The same hair color, the same eye color, the same facial structure, the same physique. It took my breath away. The atmosphere in that room was electric. We thanked her. She thanked us for taking the baby. And she said, what are you going to call the boy? She said, because I want to put that name on the birth certificate. So we said, we both like Luke. We're going to call him Luke. So that atmosphere in the hospital was, was, just, was just so wonderful. To be there with a person who's giving you the gift of a child, to have that connection and that trust, for us was absolutely overwhelming. So on the way home, we had to leave Luke in hospital because he was, he was premature. Carla said, let's check out what Luke means. Let's see what that name Luke means. We phoned up a friend. What does Luke mean? Luke means light. Luke means bringer of light. Luke means healer. We didn't know that. But that was the name of our boy. <laughs> so this is the world that we live in now. We live in Luke's world. Imagine if for 30 minutes a week, each one of you, each one of you has light inside of you. Each, light, each one of you has goodness inside of you. Imagine if for 30 minutes you sat with someone inside a sacred story circle and told your story and shine some light on someone's life. Thank you.